and we will be discussing transforming governance. A minute to first of all thank Ambassador Gill for this initiative and the Observer Research Foundation is delighted that we can work with him on something that is going to deeply change uh, our societies, our economies and certainly our political arrangements in the coming decades. Uh, sitting in India and presenting a perspective from India. We have 1.2 billion people, each of them having a few perspectives on every issue. So let me give you this morning's perspective that I have on this subject. Uh, based on what uh, Mr. Guri just mentioned and uh, Ambassador Gill's opening remarks, I think when you are uh, in a country like India, maybe even China in that particular region, four uh, factors shape our conversations um, on this particular theme and certainly on the broader questions around technological disruptions. The first, of course, is opportunity. I think most of us see this as a, a new moment uh, to be able to generate value, uh, both economic value and human value, um, using uh, these new uh, vistas that are now available. And of course, then uh, the associated questions of uh, the regulatory ecosystems, the policy environment, uh, the capacities uh, in our business uh, businesses and in our people, and of course the new social redistribution arrangements to ensure it is equitable and fair. And opportunity is clearly something that we see uh, as one factor that is shaping our approach to uh, this particular arena. The second, uh, like, is uh, prone if you are human, and since we are still not machines, is fear there is also a certain degree of trepidation that what will it do to uh, the traditional structures of, of social engagement, how will it implicate the political uh, engagements amongst various constituents, uh, what will be the future relationship between labor and capital, something that was uh, emphasized by Mr. Gurry this morning, um, what will be uh, the rights arrangements that may uh, be required to manage this new ecosystem to preserve uh, a degree of consensus that we have arrived at on the key questions around ethics and morality. And I'm saying a degree of consensus because uh, while many of us have signed the three uh, foundational documents around rights, most countries, uh, most countries, in fact all countries have sinned and erred uh, 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 at different points of time in their implementation. And finally, uh, of course, uh, I think the most important question in uh, uh, most of our geographies is the human question, uh, the identity question. What does this do to who we are? And I think we had a pre-conference dinner with 16 uh, uh, philosophers and, and entrepreneurs who were working on AI yesterday, and I believe you, you miss nothing. I was sitting through two hours of, 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 of where am I kind of a, a dinner, and you had these brilliant people each discussing the future of humanity, the future of mankind, the future of identity, but all were profoundly, um, you know, implicating uh, our key assumptions around who we are. And AI, in many ways, is not only going to change the human identification, and, and uh, you know, you mentioned jobs and labor. Most of our identities float from what we do. Now, if what we do is going to be profoundly and dramatically altered, then who we are is bound to follow in terms of, of change. And therefore, uh, human identity and the, the collective, uh, collective identity of nations is going to be, of course, again, something that we are going to discuss. So we are going to, as an opening panel, um, I, we will uh, uh, use this as an opportunity to set the agenda for the entire day. So the emerging economies are setting the agenda for the entire day. That's, that's always good. And uh, we are broadly going to uh, engage with the key questions around uh, how are we using the opportunities in our countries, uh, how do governments and policy makers respond to this, what are the capacities across businesses, and, and what are the international mechanisms of coming up with sensible arrangements. Uh, so let me start with His Excellency uh, Sultan al Ulama. Uh, uh, since I think you're probably the only minister for artificial intelligence in the world today. So, sir, uh, over to you. You have your opening remarks. Thank and you maybe I'll quiz you with a question or two after that. Please, don't hesitate to do so. Um, I think I am the only one uh, you know, available today, but I feel like many countries will follow suit and this position should be created. Maybe not at the ministerial level, if uh, that is not uh, appropriate, but at least at some sort of decision-making level within governments. Uh, I'd like to first thank the panelists and the individuals who preceded me. I feel like every day that I attend any conference on artificial intelligence, there's a new sort of insight that uh, is gained or generated from it. So thank you very much for your insights. 
Um, when talking about artificial intelligence, I feel like we are not talking about countries that are emerging or countries that are developing or developed. We are we're reaching a crossroads um, in our world today where countries have to decide. Countries and you know, uh, probably measure countries on two things, talent and resources. If you have the resources, you can invest and develop. If you have the talent, they will create the resources, the companies, so on and so forth, and you will develop. And most countries that had either one of the two or both would see, be seen as developed. Today, this equation is changing. We're seeing talent becoming machines. So countries with these machines that are able to develop the, the inventions of the future or the systems of the future, uh, do the jobs that are required much more efficiently than humans. And the resources of the, of the future is actually data. So we do see that data plays a fundamental role in moving us from where we are today to where we want to be. So this equation gives everyone an opportunity. For countries that missed the first train of creating the talent or having the resources, this is the opportunity of actually becoming part of a future where you will be among the top countries in the world. In the UAE, we believe that artificial intelligence has two main purposes. And before actually talking about these purposes, I would like to define artificial intelligence because I feel like we talk about artificial intelligence a lot and it's a very broad term. Um, I'm not talking about generalized artificial intelligence or AGI um, in my uh, speech. So, you know, for, for whoever was discussing this in the past, I feel like this is maybe a threat or an opportunity that will come in the future, but we as governments are not prepared and most discussions are not around that. Uh, I would like to discuss narrow artificial intelligence, which is a specific type of artificial intelligence that does a specific task or a job very well better than human beings. Uh, based on that, we in the UAE believe that narrow artificial intelligence will give us the advantage to alleviate people from certain jobs that were not enjoyable in the past. No one really enjoys driving in traffic. No one enjoys <laughs> you know, being yelled at at a restaurant. We used to do these jobs because it was required. And we as humans always create jobs and create opportunities when there is a need to do so. Um, so based on the, the world we live in today, there are many jobs that exist today that did not exist in the past, whether it's you know, social media influencers or social media managers um, and, and other jobs that came with the advancement of technology. We completely believe that in the long-term future, every single person is going to have a type of job that they're going to be in. Now, the risk that we have is the short and medium, uh, medium future. So we're looking at the next five to 10 years when these jobs are going to be created. If we do not create jobs for people who will be losing their jobs because of artificial intelligence, we will have massive problems in governments across the world. So it's all about riding the wave and understanding how you can migrate people to the next available job that is created. We also believe that illiteracy today is not, not being able to read and write. It is moving from that to being not able to program. Uh, in the future, if you don't speak the language of technology, you will be left <coughs> out. So we have worked on many initiatives to enable people to do so, not just in the UAE. So we have curriculums to teach people coding from kindergarten to 12, so K to 12. But we also are working to train a million people how to code in the Arab world, because we believe that if you want to improve the state of the region, you need to improve the opportunities that people have and really give them the opportunities of the future. Uh, finally, the biggest challenge that we see in the UAE, and I think this is a challenge for every country on Earth, is that artificial intelligence changes, adapts, and is not the same thing from the day that you buy it or the, the day that you use it. It keeps changing with the data sets and the things that it's exposed to. So when it comes to regulation, it is extremely difficult for you to be able to define or determine how to properly regulate it. And I think this is what all governments should come together to discuss. Now, our opinion on this is that this is something that should be democratized. Artificial intelligence should be something that the whole world comes together to discussing, to regulating uh, jointly, and to working together on advancing. It has huge potentials to advance our, our civilization, and it also has huge potential to destroy us. Destroy us, I think, mostly socially, um, because we as humans would feel obsolete if we lose our jobs to machines. But we do have an opportunity to come together and to find the right equation to, to put things in order. Like climate change, artificial intelligence will cross borders. Like climate change, it was the result of countries 
trying to advance very quickly without thinking of the consequences. And this is why I think artificial intelligence should be governed from now. We should all be part of this discussion. These debates, these discussions, these panels are extremely important for us to all share views and to work together cohesively to advance this technology in a way that benefits every single citizen across the world. I'm sorry for taking very long and uh, thank you for No, no, I think um, it was fascinating. Maybe if I can also follow up with a question. Um, how is a UAE uh, striving towards creating or building um, international conversation? Because you mentioned this is going to cross borders. So uh, how are countries like UAE who see this as a great opportunity uh, uh, working to create coalitions and, and, and partnerships that can help create an international arrangement eventually? Thank you for the question. Um, in February of this year, we hosted something called the Global Artificial Intelligence Governance Forum in Dubai. And we're going to host it every single year uh, in February uh, on the sidelines of the World Government Summit. Why we did that was because we've seen all the discussions on artificial intelligence were about long-term impacts of artificial intelligence, about you know how the private sector is using it for its benefit and government is not ready. So we brought in 150 experts from around the world. We brought in six representatives of governments as well and international organizations to discuss what governments can do today in terms of regulations and policies and legislation to ensure that we can govern artificial intelligence in its format or in its form today. And we were going to review it every single year while having a, another review happening every single month, every, sorry, every six months to ensure that uh, we are still relevant. The report we can share, and I think that everyone should have a look at and give us their feedback. And we'd invite everyone to be a part of this discussion. This is the first thing that we did. The second is we are inviting every single country that wants to work with us on ensuring that we have some sort of, I would say, testing ground for any regulation or any policy that needs to be put in place to come and test it in the UAE if they feel like their countries cannot move uh, at the fastest pace possible. Because in some countries, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of, you know, um, many layers before getting approvals. In the UAE, our leadership is committed to us being the world's open lab. We want to test things in the UAE, share our knowledge with, with everyone else, and ensure that we can progress together in a cohesive manner. And, and any emphasis on uh, investing in research and academia around the space? We are investing, actually, we, we're doing two things. The first is we're looking at having a percentage of our sovereign wealth fund investment in artificial intelligence. Uh, our sovereign wealth funds are actually quite uh, big, and we're looking at trying to enforce uh, some sort of research and development uh, criteria to happen in the UAE. So, for example, if a country, if a company is invested in, they come and do their research and development in the UAE and they bring the talent there. The second thing we're looking at is doing um, tax credits or tax incentives uh, for companies that are working in artificial intelligence or companies that are even not working in artificial intelligence who are willing to do research and development in this domain. Now, I know that we just have value-added tax uh, at the moment, but in the future, as we, uh, I think, uh, increase the taxes that we have, if we do, or we increase the fees that we have, these are going to be incentives that are given to companies and individuals who are working in this field. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let me move to uh, G.S. Madhusudan, who is a senior project advisor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. But uh, those who know him in India, like we do, He's also someone who helps draft some very important uh, position papers, white papers, along with for policymakers and along with policymakers, so he can give a unique perspective uh, uh, from the two sides uh, of the debate. Uh, and Madhu, you've heard both uh, uh, Mr. Guri and uh, His Excellency speak this morning. Sitting in India, how are you responding to very similar questions around government capabilities, the capacity to absorb AI, uh, and the business opportunities that exist? Uh, in general, I think the private sector is in its own uh, trajectory and does not really require much help or assistance. Where AI involved, evolves in our society depends to a large degree on how governments respond to it. I work both in the uh, private sector. I help advise companies, but I also work with the government in drafting policies. I'm also an advisor both to the uh, Madras High Court and to the Supreme Court of India in technology law and policies just not in policies, but also as an expert advisor in deciding specific cases. So none of this is theoretical. These are actually technology cases are coming to court where the courts are getting a little confused and are asking external experts because there's no precedent, right? And the fundamental thing that comes up is there is a major 
technology deficit in most governments, at least in the local governments and the central governments that I come across in India. Uh, th there are people, but there are no standard structures or policies in place that helps a government deal with technology in a systematic fashion. There are point persons, there are brilliant people around, there are uh, groups that deal with it, but unless there is a specific process in place, the government does not know how to negotiate policy. And the problem arises from the fact that there is a capability deficit across the government. So for example, the governments are deploying technology products left, right, and center. Uh, I'm working with uh, vehicle tracking systems and property registration systems, both of which need AI. The transportation department refused to look at the tender specification, saying that they do not have the capability to define the specifications of the software that has already been paid for. So the external supplier was allowed to basically write the terms, and the department said, we don't have a capability, let's call IIT, and that's how I got pulled in. I don't blame them. They have day-to-day -day jobs. So if you ask a person who's responsible for road traffic in Chennai, which is a city of about 8 million people, to suddenly decide on AI policies for transportation management, how is he going to deal with it? You, you can't dump societal change on a government organization that is unprepared for. So if governments need to negotiate AI policies, they really need to uh, uh, get technology into the thinking process. And that is a tough challenge. The problem is not just AI. The problem is how do governments mediate technology in general? That capability has to be built. And AI is just one example of where all governments, including the US government, will have a problem. The other problem is because of this, Technology is getting installed in the government left, right, and center without checks and balances. We are putting in systems without any concern about data privacy because the data privacy uh, legislation is not in place. So what happens 20 years from now when GDPR's implications, when AI's implications all come, your foundation for the next generation government has been put in place. You can't rip it apart and put a new government uh, structure in place. So how do you deal with it? So time is running out on that. Manpower is also a problem because in most governments, it's the generalists who rule the roost. They are the ones who are there throughout the power structure. They are the ones who go above a certain level. The technocrats get stopped at a particular rung. So at a senior policy-making decision points, you will never find a technocrat. And uh, the bureaucracy is structured in such a way that lateral hiring at the highest levels is simply not permitted. You have all the standard excuses. We have done this for 30 years. We know how to do it. India is a complex place of 1.2 billion people. How does the techie who has worked for IBM possibly help us deal with policy? Part of it is territorial. Part of it is valid. But if you don't have technocrats at the highest level of decision making, what's the point of all of these discussions? Somebody who is a generalist is going to make the call, right? So that has to get alleviated significantly. The biggest problem, and this has happened with technology, is that Governments tend to look at uh, technology in a very monochromatic view. Economic benefits, which comes in terms of taxes, guard, and uh, in case of AI, job loss. So it's a binary. If it makes money, good. Less jobs, good, right? Access to technology, data privacy, implications of society, societal changes. These terms don't even exist in the vocabulary of government discussions. So you're talking about how we deal with the problem, Cognizance of the problem itself is not there, right? So I'm hoping forums like this actually permeate government thinking and realize that we are facing a, not a problem, it's a change of dramatic proportions. Uh, uh, human beings tend to adjust to whatever level of misery that we are subjected to. <laughs> so <laughs> AI brings changes, I'm pretty sure we'll adapt to it for the good or the bad. That I'm not worried about. But how governments will uh, deal with it and the trouble that the transition entails is a problem. For those of you who are science fiction fans, if you have read Asimov's thing, his whole premise was, look, the change cannot be uh, altered. It's going to come. But the, the problems that the change will bring, we'll try to mitigate the uh, uh, troubles that arise. So you can't avoid the AI future. How you negotiate AI future is the key for a government. And where is the bright side of things for a person who's sitting in India and AI? So this, you've given us the dark side of it. No, no. Now, what uh, is the opportunity here? The opportunity basically is for a lot of entities to engage with the uh, government and put the necessary structure in place. Doing that is fairly easy. It takes a bit of lobbying. It, 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 India also has a positive of think tanks, especially in the strategic sector. I, I don't think a technology think tank even exists in India. 
which is which is very very uh, unfortunate but in all fairness we got our independence 50 years ago so feeding 800 million people was a bigger priority than trying to figure out if computers need to be made locally but we are past that phase so uh, i'm not a pessimist it can be done i'm just concerned that the uh, there's not enough thinking about this so i think uh, forums like these are also hosted this doesn't apply only to india when i'm talking india i'm using india as a proxy for africa uh, for the middle east and for uh, large parts of asia I, i don't think korea or taiwan or japan would have a problem but the other asian countries would have a problem china would have a problem to some degree india would have africa would have so now let's find out the korean problems let's go to david chen associate professor department of aerospace engineering korean advanced institute of science and technology he is also someone who flies uh, 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 automated F-16s, <laughs> uh, right? So David, over to you. I can say that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm a I'm a professor in uh, aerospace engineering, KAIST. Uh, I'm uh, also serving as some advisor in government. So, and also this is the third time in UNOG. Uh, I was in the last meeting before. So uh, this is because it's very exciting, and uh, I can talk about the Korean government's uh, experience uh, because I'm also engaged in that area. As you know, Korea has a very uh, a number of the uh, famous uh, IT companies like Samsung or LG to catch up with the AI, the field of AI. And uh, in Korea, the uh, the concept of the fourth industrial revolution, which is created by the uh, the World Economic Forum right across the lake here, uh, the World Economic Forum now made that, and uh, Korea adopted this concept pretty fast. And uh, Uh, I, I'm not sure the government really understands the whole the good thing and bad thing of a fourth industrial revolution, but I think they took it more as the industrial 4.0, where government, a uh, German government, uh, proposed a few years ago as the how to promote their industrial, you know, the efficiency. So uh, they embraced it pretty fast, and that they opened up a fourth industrial revolution. committee in government in the 2017 and uh, recently they also um, uh, they called it uh, the human centered of force in this revolution uh, it sounds pretty good but then there is uh, some uh, good side or bad side of it uh, in terms of the conceptual maturity I'll talk about this soon and uh, also in very recently actually this week uh, our government also announced that they're going to uh, have a huge uh, funding uh, program to in improve, to introduce the uh, fourth industrial revolution. They call it um, a, uh, the uh, iKorea 4.0 program. And uh, the, over the next five years, they're going to um, invest uh, $2 billion. I think it kind of uh, overshadowed by the numbers I just heard us uh, like 30 minutes ago. But um, that's uh, the government's uh, funding. And uh, also they nurture the science and industry And uh, raise a lot of uh, AI experts in the in the related area, and uh, uh, construct a lot of uh, data set. They, it's kind of interesting. They have a very specific number for this data set, 160 million data set. I don't know exactly where they are from coming from. But um, uh, the our government's uh, approach is to in AI and is uh, how to uh, make the Korean um, competitiveness in this area better. So it's more of the industrial uh, booming approach. So it is a uh, government driven, like many Asian countries, uh, where the fundamentals of the AI science and theories, academia is a kind of a thin. So uh, the Korea has to try to nurture this by injecting the, pumping the government fund into it. <coughs> and, uh, and also the, uh, this is, uh, uh, they don't really know, they don't really have a very good plan how to uh, integrate this AI's outcome into the various level of a society. For example, can we make our society more efficient, more you know, intelligent, for example, using many kind of uh, the AI inventions? Uh, I don't really see too many of it uh, because it's uh, like uh, many uh, uh, Asian countries, uh, it is a typical thing happening in the centralized government. The approach here in Korea, or like many other countries uh, over there, is that uh, can you do this? So when you have this question, is that the answer is goes like, uh, we cannot do that because there's no law for it to make us do it. It's like different from the, we can do it because there is no law for it. So in our country, the other way around, there is no law law, so we cannot do it. So this kind of a, a problem happens with the latest uh, disrupting technologies like uh, Uber, you know, when Uber comes in and then um, 
many existing taxi companies are very, very uh, not happy about it. And that also poses a problem because of the nature of AI is very disruptive. And also, um, in the, the other problem is that um, uh, there is the job loss problem. So we, our government uh, says uh, they do a human-centered uh, force in the revolution. But um, it's kind of a, a interesting conflict concept there because the very reason the World Economic Forum uh, mentioned for industrial revolution is that uh, it involves the job displacement because the AI replaces the human mind. So that we, you know, but although the AI right now is not matching human level of intelligence, but we don't need that to replace the job because many of the typical uh, factory floor job requires a simple vision processing with simple manual operations. So that kind of a job can be very easily uh, replaced by AI. So um, uh, there's not a very good plan going on right now. So for, to, to get prepared for this, we need to adjust the education, we need to adjust the uh, labor market, and uh, we need to adjust, for example, I think that this uh, autonomous car will be a very good uh, showcase for this. Uh, with autonomous cars, uh, we are trying to introduce and the government has a very good program to allow us to test our car on the street. But um, autonomous cars, uh, we believe it's useful because it drives better than human. So that if I uh, expand that, uh, that argument to the military system, then the human soldiers can be replaced by autonomous system because they are better than human, human operators. So this is, has a huge implication because that's the reason we have uh, annual meetings here in UNOG for that. And the, but for machine, uh, autonomous cars, uh, turning the wheel left and right is uh, just the same as uh, to search and destroy the target in left or right. So it's the very same problem for machine. So the autonomous car, how to embrace it into the society is a very good uh, showcase of uh, how we deal with the AI the technology over there. So in Korea, we have a very um, ide ideological charge, the labors, labor unions. So any changes, especially with AI, when it means a displacement, uh, it's going to be very difficult to persuade them. I had a personal talk with a taxi uh, owner company, uh, the owner of the company, and then he was very, very nervous of the the future change when the autonomous cars really come along. But um, uh, they had no plan whatsoever about that. So uh, they, so in this case, we need to plan ahead for education. But the problem is that. Um, this kind of AI problem is that uh, it really happens very fast, and even the experts have a different opinions and how it goes in next to 10, 20 years. Uh, in order for us to get prepared, we need uh, 10, 20 years of the time, but um, we even know what's going to happen. For example, uh, cell phone, the, the smartphone, it introduced in 2007 in Apple, and uh, now it changes our lives completely, but um, just before 10 years in 2007, which is in 1997, no one expected the smartphone coming out. And uh, so, so AI just uh, ha happened like uh, in the early 2010s, and then we don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, so yet we have to be prepared for all the education, the job market, tech systems, and ethics and laws and all that. So we are uh, throwing punches in the dark right now, so it's kind of very difficult. And so uh, even technology people have difficulties, government have more difficulty. So um, this is a... Uh, in the more the centralized government countries like Korea, uh, we have a difficulty because uh, that's the best reason I, I could, uh, he discussed, uh, the government has to be uh, thinking very hard. But um, again, when it involves a lot of large job displacement uh, from people, and then any kind of a democratic country, uh, com countries with the elections, uh, when you, you have involves a lot of uh, job displacement, then that means you're losing uh, votes. So the government uh, has a very difficult situation and uh, many times uh, this kind of situations, governments act for a uh, uh, populist kind of a direction. So that's uh, uh, sometimes not good for social, you know, social benefit, uh, social ide ideal direction. So that's the problem. So, um, uh, so uh, like I said, uh, we have to be prepared in the difficulty of understanding what's going to happen with all the very fast developing AI, even the expert doesn't know how, to, how it goes. Yet, we have to be prepared, so we have to uh, discuss more, having more discussions, and, uh, 
and then have some kind of a, this kind of form and more and more. Thank you. Uh, David, I want to ask you a question because you mentioned this last night when we were having an informal conversation, but I think it's a fascinating point for you to share with all of us the challenges around <coughs> the startup sector and the tech firms who are actually producing some of these key uh, solutions and technologies that go into the larger AI ecosystem. What is this Korean challenge, which is a very specific Korean challenge? I think that's a... Oh, yeah, that's a very good uh, point. Um, the Korean challenge is that uh, we have a small domestic market, and uh, in globally, we are facing very fierce competitions from China, U.S., and many other already uh, very uh, countries doing very well. So um, our government uh, tried to nurture those uh, startups very much, but um, our, uh, the s startups also have limited uh, choices in the future because our government also has a very strong restriction on what they call JABAL, the conglomer conglomerates of the enterprise. So those uh, conglomerates are not allowed to acquire startups. So <laughs> there are not good exit plans for those small companies. And also the many kind of uh, the investment programs are not very well uh, planned. So uh, this kind of, uh, so that's the reason why I think that's a pretty good point that our, the AI development is not, uh, is not happening on the, from the entrepreneur level, but more of the government driven level. And uh, there's always a pro uh, limit. Our government uh, always uh, says that government will be serving as the primer of this certain thing. They're going to create the government, uh, initiate the market, but it's very small. Mm -hmm. So the, the future is very limited. And are there uh, any discussions in government to try and rectify this, to create an innovation economy that has an exit strategy? They are trying to recently relax the rule that uh, the Jebel can acquire small companies. But um, uh, due to the lack of this kind of a positive uh, feedback for many, many years, so they don't know how to do it. So the small con companies, uh, then they don't know how to make the value better to get acquired by large country companies. So, so the kind of a culture is virtually next to non-existent. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, let me move ecosystem. What is the Korean challenge, which is a very specific Korean challenge? I think that's a... Oh, yeah, that's a very good uh, point. Um, the Korean challenge is that uh, we have a small domestic market, and uh, in globally, we are facing very fierce competitions from China, U.S., and many other already uh, very uh, countries doing very well. So um, our government uh, tried to nurture those uh, startups very much, but... Um, our, uh, the startups also have limited uh, choices in the future because our government also has a very strong restriction on what they call JABAL, the conglomer conglomerates of the enterprise. So those uh, conglomerates are not allowed to acquire startups. So <laughs> there are not good exit plans for those small companies. And also the many kind of uh, the investment programs are not very well uh, planned. So uh, this kind of, uh, so that's the reason why I think that's a pretty good point that our, the AI development is not, uh, is not happening on the, from the entrepreneur level, but more of the government driven level. And uh, there's always a pro uh, limit. Our government uh, always uh, says that government will be serving as the primer of this certain thing. They're going to create the government, uh, initiate the market, but it's very small. Mm -hmm. So the, the future is very really limited. And are there uh, any discussions in government to try and rectify this, to create an innovation economy that has an exit strategy? They are trying to recently relax the rule that uh, the JABAL can acquire small companies. But um, uh, due to the lack of this kind of a positive uh, feedback for many, many years, so they don't know how to do it. So the small mm -hmm. companies, uh, then they don't know how to make the value better to get acquired by large country companies. So, so the kind of a culture is virtually next to non-existent. Thank you, uh, David. Let me move to uh, uh, Professor Pascal Fung from the Department of Electronics and Computer Engineering, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, yesterday in the course of our conversation, uh, uh, she made some fascinating observations around uh, what's happening in China specifically and maybe Pascal, I'll turn it over to you. 
and you can share your thoughts on that and more on, on this yes. particular subject. So um, as I've talk often talked about the AI market in China, um, today I want to mention just a little bit about that. So I think one of the uh, many strengths, uh, favorable uh, conditions for AI development, R&D in China is uh, uh, there's a large talent pool of engineering, uh, uh, engineers, but also there's a one language, a single linguistic market of a, a billion people, so which is Chinese language. And I think the single linguistic market is uh, what makes uh, the American companies and the Chinese companies so successful in, uh, for two reasons. One is the uh, large user base that allows them to have uh, a huge amount of data in a single language. And secondly, is a homogeneous user base uh, uh, based on that language. But today also I want to uh, mention a little bit about the role of the Chinese government in, uh, and, and its plans in, in, um, in supporting AI R&D. So uh, people might have heard of the uh, a recent document uh, published by the uh, State Council of China on issuing the development plan on the new generation of, of artificial intelligence. And I would like to mention the uh, strategic ob objectives laid out by our government. There are three, actually. By 2020, the overall technology and application of AI should be in sync with the world's advanced level. And the AI industry will become a new important economic growth point. This is very important because um, I would say that since I study in the US in AI, um, I've been in AI uh, for nearly 30 years, and I've also studied in Europe and uh, obviously in, in Japan, and also obviously working in Hong Kong. I would say that the AI strategy in US has largely been defense driven uh, for many decades, whereas in China it's growth driven. So the 2020 goal is to bring the AI technology to be in sync with the world's advanced level. Note that we do not consider our current level to be world's advanced level, <laughs> which I think is a bit modest. But, uh, and the second objective is to achieve uh, a breakthrough of the basic theory of artificial intelligence by 2025. This is, uh, we're aiming to actually to become a, a leader in AI technology by then. And, uh, and then our technology should reach the world's leading level by 2025. By 2030, uh, the AI theory technology and applications should have reached the world's leading level and become the world's major artificial intelligence innovation center. And also the smart economy and smart society should have achieved remarkable uh, results laying an important foundation for becoming a forerunner of innovative countries and economic powers. This is a very ambitious plan by 2030. So what, do we, what does our government think we need to do to achieve that? What are the key tasks? So number one, uh, we need to build an open and collaborative artificial intelligence technology innovation system. So following the recent, uh, I think people are probably uh, familiar with the open source movements by all the big AI companies in the US, Chinese are also uh, open sourcing everything we do. So that's an open and collaborative AI technology innovation system. Uh, second key task is to establish a new generation of key common technology systems for AI. And the third is to lay out an innovation platform for AI. Fourth is to accelerate the training and gathering of high-end gathering of high -end talents for AI. So this is, has always been the uh, important element of uh, high-tech development in China, which is to attract and retain talents, many of whom uh, are educated overseas. So there are actual funding schemes and uh, very generous uh, uh, um, package to attract these talents home and to retain them. And uh, one of the tasks is to accelerate this process. And, um, and also another task to build an ubiquitous but safe and efficient intelligent infrastructure system. So, <clears throat> and to lay out a new generation of AI major technology projects. So these are the broad brush uh, key, key, uh, key tasks that Chinese government uh, plans that for, for us to achieve. And I will say that these, um, this was laid out in the white paper that was co-authored and at least in consultation with the top technology companies in China as well as the top academics. And I would also like to talk about AI standards. I would say that China is probably leading in implementing AI standards uh, in our country. 
And uh, in the past, there have been various national committees for AI standards. Uh, in different industries, for example, the National Information Technology Standardization Technical Com Committee has been setting standards for AI terminology, HCI, biometrics, big data, cloud computing. So these are uh, under the uh, 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 information technology technology standardization. The National Committee for Automation System and Integration Standardization has been setting standards for automation and robotics. And the National Audio, Video, and Multimedia Standardiza Standardization Technical Committee has been standing, setting standards for smart living and wearables. The National Information Security Standardization Technical Committee has been working on st standards for biometrics for national security. National Intelligent Transport System Standardization Technical Com Committee has been standard, setting standards for intelligent transport systems. So the various national standardization committees have been working on this in the past. So uh, in January 2018, the government has directed a uh, centralized and coordinating uh, standards body to set up by the China Electronics Technology Research Institute and this is a new standards co committee that's centralizing all the standardization in AI. And a white paper on AI standards was issued and released in, uh, by then, to, to the 2018 edition. And it was edited by top corporations, including the BATs, Baidu, Alibaba, and uh, Tencent, and top universities. And we aim to work together with international standards bodies. So my personal role, I have been uh, representing uh, on the uh, partnership on AI with uh, uh, top um, companies, and I'm also uh, have been an expert on the World Economic Forum. I have been invited here and talking with a lot of international bodies, and I work with the Chinese um, on, on also uh, AI technology and standards. And uh, so, what are the uh, standards we're looking to set? Um, the major AI trends that have been described that we think of are the open source of technology platforms, number one, AI moving towards AGI someday, number two. <laughs> the uh, number three is the intelligent perception moving towards intelligent cognition technology. So I have been uh, a, a researcher in, the, uh, in speech recognition and then natural language processing, as well as uh, effective computing for nearly 30 years. So, the technology that recognizes your speech and translate that into text, and the technology that recognizes an object, whether it's a cat or dog, are considered intelligent perception technology. And these technologies are fast maturing and reaching human parity, if not already surpass human in many areas. But the next challenge we are really moving towards intelligent cognition technology, so the understanding <coughs> of your language, the understanding of user intentions, the understanding of uh, emotions and uh, the effective uh, man-machine interaction. Now, uh, to, uh, of note is also that China has considered AI safety, ethics, and privacy to be of uh, very important, uh, of highest importance, and it has been discussed in the white paper. It is mentioned as vital to beneficial AI. So there's a separate standardization group working on a standardization for AI safety, ethics, and privacy. Um, Chinese people are concerned about their privacy. Uh, and uh, the data privacy and safety are also very important to our government. So, and why? Because standards are seen as a way to build a trust of the public in AI technology. It's a way to build trust of the public in the government. So um, it is beneficial. Standards are seen as beneficial to technology transfer and to improve product and services qualities. And they are seen as important to ensure consumer safety and uh, confidence. So this is the, uh, on the, on the overall the picture of uh, seen by the Chinese government. And it's actually been, uh, uh, have been implemented and uh, it will be executed. You should, you know, we, we know that when Chinese government has decided on something, it will be done. So, <laughs> no, let so, me ask you one quick question sure. that I asked uh, His Excellency uh, Alan Lama, that what is the Chinese effort to create international conversations and to create an international effort to come up with uh, ethics, standards, and uh, regimes that uh, can see partnership by many? Yes. So, so some of us came here. 
uh, also were at the AI for Good Summit. Um, I noticed that uh, there are not many Chinese uh, compared to other um, people of other nationalities. There were perhaps um, less than 10 of us at the AI for Good Summit. So uh, we had a little discussion and we think that our job really is to, in a way, translate China for the world mm -hmm. and translate the world for China. So when we go back, we'll be organizing summits and conferences with, uh, to, to speak to Chinese to the Chinese public and the government and the companies, and we'll invite some of you to come speak. And also we come here and we talk to you and, and sort of decode China for you. So it is a beginning. So China has uh, our own effort of setting up standards, but we also participate in international efforts in doing so. Let me ask you the tough question. What do you see as the key risk for China's enthusiasm? on this sector is moving a bulk part of your population from manufacturing to different jobs or reskilling them. What are the risks or the, uh, the, the challenges that the government is aware of that it must respond to? So I am not an economist, but I was saying any growth-driven development, if we single-mindedly focus on growth, there is some risk. For example, uh, we're not talking about job replacement issue at all. We're not talking about how, um, you know, uh, how uh, people's um, uh, perception of their life will be changed. We're not talking about how machines might alienate societies and families. We're not talking about these issues. We're, still, we're very single-mindedly uh, growth-focused. So I would say that could be a risk in that area that we're not looking at. But since uh, we're talking about this with the international community, I think China will also pay attention to this. So um, yeah, that, that is a risk. Uh, because we cannot predict, no, no, none of us, technologists and nor our government, can predict what the life will be like for our citizen uh, in 10 years from today due to AI. Your Excellency, can I pose the same question to you? Yes. That uh, I think you also mentioned moving people to the next job. Now that movement is not organic, right? It requires policy intervention, skill, your skills and training, and a whole new ecosystem. And similarly, uh, the human perception of their role in that particular ecosystem will also change. And how are, is your government uh, responding to that key challenge? So I would actually like to point back to Mr. Uh, uh, on the point that he made about government officials not understanding artificial intelligence, we've seen that as the biggest risk, that government officials are presented with systems that might have tremendous impact, uh, whether it's you know, through back doors being accessed by uh, certain uh, parties or by it actually going through algorithm bias and providing advice that is uh, wrong and not sound. So what we did was um, we are training all government officials from minister level to, to uh, head of department in artificial intelligence um, systems and uh, in understanding the, the actual concept of artificial intelligence, what are the risks, what you should be asking uh, certain companies and certain individuals that can present to you these, these systems. I think this is the first risk and we're trying to create some sort of uh, deviation away from it. The second, as you said, is migrating people. Uh, I'm going to discuss something that is still not out, we're still working on it, um, but we're trying to push this uh, policy forward. We're, we're trying to create a fund that is focused on migrating people to the next most feasible job. Now, this fund is going to be funded by government bodies or semi-government bodies who are implementing AI systems. So if you're implementing an AI system that is going to create savings, um, that saving for the first year should be invested in the fund. And this fund will focus on migrating these people into new jobs that are, are going to be created or creating new jobs for them. So um, if that does go through, then I think we can mitigate some sort of risk there. The final thing is, I think it all goes back to the people. Um, if awareness is still the way that it is today, with the media showing us the Terminator scenario, <laughs> AGI, and how it's going to destroy jobs and lives, people are going to retaliate and react. Mm. And I feel like if it happens prematurely, it's going to end many of the developments that we see today in some of the most important countries. Now, the countries that are at the forefront of this technology are the ones that are most at risk of that, Correct. whether it's China, India, the US, Russia. So I feel like the media has to be a lot more unbiased and has to educate people on what this technology really is and what are all the risks and the opportunities in a neutral way. Um, most of the news that I receive on my phone today are either you know, extremely negative or 
positive with a negative twist. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's something that, that I think we should be doing. Uh, so I, I think this is a good segue to uh, open it up to all of you to come and participate. Um, please uh, try and get my attention. I will invite you, introduce yourself. You can either make a short comment or pose a question to any of the panelists. But before that, uh, let me invite one member uh, this morning, uh, Mr. P. Anandan, uh, Professor P. Anandan, who is the chief executive of the Vadwani Center for Artificial Intelligence in Bombay. And uh, so I think his, uh, his, uh, the, his Excellency, in a sense, has framed the debate for you. Uh, okay. what, uh, you know, how do you make this more uh, palatable and more uh, assimilative in key societies? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Ambassador, for inviting me here of this. And this is a fantastic place to be, to hear about the opinions and, uh, you know, the ideas that are there. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Vadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. This is a, a privately philanthrop funded philanthropic initiative of Dr. Ramesh Vadwani and Mr. Sunil Vadwani, two very successful entrepreneurs of Indian origin living in the U.S. and they've been giving back and part of their initiative, two brothers who worked together to create this, uh, you know, set up this institute and invited me to uh, come and uh, build it. Uh, and my background is AI. I have about 35 years of uh, background in artificial intelligence research, both in academia and in industry. I was the uh, head of the Microsoft Research Lab in India. I founded it and built it and I was also head of Microsoft uh, computer science, computer vision research area in the US. Uh, the point of this institute is actually one of the things that kind of didn't come out explicitly in the comments that made is actually if you look at the positive side of AI, most of the time it's currently you know, available to the developed seg segments of economies in any country, even in India to the say affordable middle class about 300, 300 million people. There's between three and five billion people in the world who are actually not seeing at the moment, or there's not immediate opportunity for them to see the benefits of this technology. C commercial companies are naturally not going there because there's not a market opportunity there. And India has always been a leader in addressing this sector. So our institute's charter is actually to look for ways in which AI can benefit the underserved communities. In India, it will be about 800 to 900 million. We are not limited to India, of course. What does that mean? That means in domains such as public health, education, uh, public infrastructure, agriculture, a b you know, large percentage of, uh, you know, communities in the world rely still on agriculture as their means of income, and small farmers don't have the wherewithal to benefit from, say, precision farming techniques and such, uh, as well as in financial inclusion, which is increasingly becoming an opportunity. So our approach is to actually uh, solicit uh, opportunities working with government and social sector partners. And one of the things here is that in order to do anything in the societal domain, you will have to work with government or social sector organizations because they're the only ones who really understand the audience, the customers, or the market, and they are the only ones who can scale. In fact, it's the government that primarily can scale to national levels, so we are very much engaged in doing it. We have just started. We were inaugurated in February, uh, thankfully, by the Honorable Prime Minister of India himself, which is an indication of his commitment uh, to seeing AI applied to social good, and so we're very fortunate. In fact, the kind of approach we are taking, and I think a theme that is likely to emerge in India is actually what you might call inclusive AI for everybody. And uh, you know, we're just getting started. And to reflect on the comments, I think uh, what uh, Dr. Madhusudan and uh, the others reflected, the government is in a serious uh, situation of lack of knowledge. And this is something uh, the government is willing to admit and are seeking help. In fact, the Prime Minister, in his comments, mentioned his three priorities are how do we sensitize government to the benefit and the proper use of AI? How do we create a viable, a secure, a privacy protected, and sustainable data ecosystem? And most importantly, how do we create human resource potential uh, to serve you know, both the industry as well as uh, the social sector? So with that, you know, I'll stop. Thank you very much for the opportunity. These comments will teach me a lot more than I can give. So. Thank you. Does someone else want to come in with a comment? Or? Yes, please. Introduce yourself and please pose your question. Um, let, let me first of all start by thanking the organizers for what's, what I believe is a very timely sort of discussion here today. Um, as we use artificial intelligence, I think the point that was raised by Mr. Madhu Sudan, there is no doubt that there are very positive elements of using AI or indeed technology to the benefit of mankind. And that we, we know that 
the more we benefit from it, the more probably would be a situation would improve in terms of addressing poverty, health, and all that. But I think the, the point that he raised was that, you know, the generalists are the ones looking at how these technologies work. And when it comes to regulation, we are not moving as fast as we should in terms of applying the technology, but not looking at how could we regulate the technology? Because even though there are such positive elements, we need to stop and think of, you know, how does this take charge of our lives? I, I say this because I attended one event. I think it was held, and, and I think somebody from India was saying, we're looking at privacy in the digital age. And he said, we, the, the, the conclusion from it is that, you know, privacy in the digital age is a, is a human right. And I think he told us that India is one of the first countries that now have legislation relating to privacy, to data privacy. And I was just wondering how this could apply to other areas. I mean, what do you think about it? Because I think we need to look at this. We need to, there needs to be at some point regulation. This is not to say that these technologies are not useful, but at some point they need to be regulated. Thank you. I think that's a very important question. Um, you know, coming from a country where we have seen growth happening in sectors when governments were unaware of the sector, it, you know, lends me to believe that regulation must be light. Wherever we have seen heavy regulation, we have seen um, a, a slowdown in growth. But at the same time, such profound transformative developments uh, should not surprise us 10 years later. So how, what is the regulatory balance that we need to maintain in responding to uh, this kind of a situation? So I've been working specifically with the Commerce Ministry on drafting regulation. I come partly from the private sector so in the meetings, I say more regulation. The government says less regulation. <laughs> so, so, so this is like Alice in Wonderland, right? So you think and say, that, hey, private sector, I should say less regulation, you should say more. They're scared. They're completely scared. They will avoid meetings because nobody wants to take a decision. The choice is not between less and more regulation. The choice is between sensible and the kind of idiotic regulation. regulation, right? So unfortunately, the debate gets twisted saying all regulation is bad and light regulation uh, is good. Data privacy, I've been asking for data privacy nearly for 20, 22 years. We, uh, we actually tried to start a data privacy exchange in 1998. Everybody laughed. Fast forward to 2018, everybody is scared. You would have heard about our uh, other database and stuff. Well, the technology itself is value neutral. How you deploy technology is the question. My biggest concern, especially in the emerging economies, is that Decisions are being taken by an elite few without involvement. In India, data privacy, we talk about it. The Supreme Court has given a judgment saying it is a fundamental right. All of that is done. But probably about 2 million people, 3 million people are part of the discussion. We are a nation of 1.3 billion people. So 1.297 billion people can't even spell privacy. How on earth are you going to get proper regulation when the vast majority of the population is not involved in the debate. Can I come to you, Minister? Yes. I think that um, having a regulation is always better than not having any regulation at all. But there is a risk there of hindering innovation and you know not allowing these companies to move forward. So I'm a fan of actually having very broad regulations that are being built on with the private sector. It is always good to engage the experts that are developing this technology and moving forward. But governments need to have some sort of broad uh, regulatory framework that you know, expands over time to ensure that the citizen or the customer is protected. Uh, that, I think, is my point. David? Yes, uh, I work also as a regulator in terms of the drone rulemaking. And uh, I, uh, it's, uh, I can say that uh, we need a good regulation, not a bad regulation, or uh, we need a I, I would say the bad regulation is the regulation that based on some kind of a unbased fear or just a wrong understanding. For example, in Korea, there could, we could have had a, a good thing it didn't happen, but we could have had the regulation on the autonomous cars that we all have to report the, the operation of regulated car, autonomous car for testing. It's like those kind of red flag rule for in, in old UK. Mm -hmm. so, Fortunately, it was shut down before it was enacted. 
but um, it was one case that is a bad regulation. They don't understand the technology. Also, the other side of the drone, many people say that let's just do it, let's do the, the drone delivery altogether now, today in Seoul. But it's not possible because there's a huge uh, dangerous mm -hmm. factors because it can just drop out of the sky and you're hurting people. In this case, many people in the industry say, let's suspend the regulation. I, I say in aviation, everything is about safety because anything falls out of the sky is dangerous. So in this case, the regulation needs to be good in order to be a good regulation. People have to understand the technology, not just some kind of a, a congressman in Korea who's just uh, itchy to make those kind of any kind of a, a regulation which is not based on the <laughs> future. Uh, or just uh, they're just doing it for their own, you know, the accomplishment or a quota of their work. Okay. Askel, you want to comment on this? Yeah. So as a technologist, I always find that uh, regulations are very, very difficult when you don't know what you're regulating. So um, it's telling that one of the first jobs of standards committees uh, is to uh, define terms to clearly define terms, what they are, and to have a consensus and people agree on what they are. So for example, privacy. What is privacy? What is data privacy? I think I'll get 100 answers from 100 people today. So how can you have like, uh, legislation uh, to, to govern these issues if we're not clear on the concept? And one of the challenges today is that um, it's, it's been tremendously difficult to communicate the technical definition, to reconcile, I would say, technical te definition, many terminologies in AI, with the societal definitions of them. So um, there are not enough of uh, AI practitioners uh, who are coming and talking and asking, uh, communicating with the society and the stakeholders about what we are doing clearly in a non-arcane and accessible fashion. And uh, so the narrative of AI has so far been, in my view, hijacked by Hollywood by all these movies, and I've been always asked to define terms according to movie terminology. Um, but that's not the reality, that's the uh, fictional world, and we, we really need to be uh, working really hard in defining these terms from not just big terms like AI, but actual uh, terms like what is machine learning, and what is data, what is data? What is big data? Uh, where does data go to and, uh, and go down really to drill down to the uh, uh, detail levels and work together with the legislators, the lawyers and the engineers together to define these terms, to, to define the framework. Then we can talk about regulation and legislation more uh, effectively. Otherwise, we don't know what we are le legislating. Uh, so that is actually a deeper side of this. I first of all, I think agree that as much as regulation is needed, uh, leaving it to the governments is actually risky because they don't understand enough on how to regulate. And I'm not surprised that the government is reluctant to do so. I think it's an admission of a lack of uh, expertise. But you know, with AI, it's not simply about privacy of your data or if your data, uh, you know, is uh, is exposed or sold to the wrong people, but. Only the technologists understand that the very nature of the services that the AI algorithms develop is influenced by the data itself. And if the data is not representative or biased, and we've already seen that in a number of cases, uh, you know, it can lead to decisions by autonomous systems that are actually what we might consider wrong or unethical because they were trained on the wrong kind of data with, you know, with the wrong kind of uh, knowledge. And, it's really only the technologists that have the depth of understanding to be able to define the kind of risks that are associated with the data and the kind of uh, you know, protections, kind of uh, maybe uh, governance models that have to be. And I think ultimately standard bodies are probably much better places to go because they often represent the technology companies than directly government. Uh, we have time for one last intervention, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. Just wanted to uh, connect uh, this discussion uh, on uh, uh, national level uh, tensions in terms of over-regulation and under-regulation to what uh, is the situation internationally. Uh, so I agree very much with Pascal that uh, uh, there needs to be clarity about certain essential concepts and characteristics uh, before we move on to the stage of uh, either 
hard regulation or soft regulation or somewhere uh, in between. But there is also uh, a difficulty, which is that it's very hard to agree on uh, common definitions uh, uh, internationally. So while we progress on that front by clarifying concepts and characteristics that are relevant to any field that we are seeking to regulate, uh, we also need to engage on the, the risks as well, uh, which uh, uh, um, uh, wouldn't be reflected in any good regulation uh, uh, scheme. So what is, according to the panel, what is the best way of uh, putting together uh, these experiences, these reflections from around the world on the essential concepts? One example that I can uh, uh, perhaps mention, and we do have IEEE representatives here, is the IEEE's work on uh, uh, draft definitions, where you look at a concept from three or four angles. Uh, uh, the engineering community's angle, the social sciences community's angle, the policy community's angle, the ethical legal community's angle. Uh, so is there some way in which we can bring these reflections uh, together uh, so that uh, when we go back either to regulate nationally or we go into international forums to reflect on the best models of regulation, best models of governance, uh, we do so in an informed and wise manner, not in, uh, in an impulsive or, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 difficult uh, manner, difficult from the perspective of the industry that wants to go ahead with developing and deploying air systems. Thank you. Ma'am. Please introduce yourself and pose the question. Thank you. I'm Renata Dwan from Unidir. And um, thank you for that. And I wanted to build on, on Amandeep's point maybe a little bit. I, I found this discussion fascinating, but I found it very ahistorical. Uh, the debate between generalists and technicians is as debate as old as government. Correct. And we've had that debate around issues of, of the military industrial complex. We've had it around computers. We've had it around 19th century utilitarian concepts of of governance, we've had it in colonialism about who and how. So I think sometimes we can find a more fruitful avenue to this by first not setting this completely ahistorically, by saying that this is part of the tensions we have had, and then saying what is new. And some of the factors that are new here are the speed of the development, so that the decisions that need to, to take place in regulation, the quiet mm -hmm. contemplation, the comprehensive assessment, just simply don't have that time. So I, I think it, that's important because it, it gets us away from an either or and it starts us to look at, at a little bit where we want to go to. I share Amandeep's, um, although he's much more uh, in depth in this discussion, the challenges of agreeing on definitions at the international level. And, and in addition to, therefore, the need for a parallel discussion on the risks, I would say that we need a parallel discussion on the objectives. And sometimes it's easier for us to coalesce around a set of principles about what we want to think about artificial, or the goals that we understand in regulation and standardization than it is to get us to a definition. So I just wanted to ask the panelists from your views of countries, has that been a helpful uh, experience or way in forward, the discussion around principles and objectives, for example, human autonomy and, and control or uh, issues around yeah, that. Has that been that way in about where do we I want to get to and then how as opposed to starting from a perception of where do we don't want to get to? Great. So we have uh, two interventions uh, uh, from the uh, audience uh, and we can probably also now wrap up the session. So I will go down and uh, go down the panel, starting with David, give you all maybe a minute each, and you don't have to answer both of them, you can pick one of them, and you can also add something that you want to add uh, 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 by way of your closing remarks. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, great honor to us be present here, and uh, so the, uh, uh, in many, many countries uh, we just discussed, discussed is uh, AI is uh, more treated as a growth uh, mean to to excite the industry, and then uh, as we do that, there's a problem. There can be a problem because uh, uh, this uh, AI uh, field of AI is uh, more is uh, more of a driven by the academia, the bright, brilliant minds, and then uh, this is a very very early stage. Yet it is very powerful to change our our daily lives grounded up, and then uh, still, uh, for example, in our, our government, uh, we they do have a good plans, but um, 
that I don't think we really think they are really well executed, especially in the part that are where there are a lot of uh, stakeholders have uh, different uh, opinions on it, especially when the people are ideologically charged. It's very hard to f uh, find a good, uh, sensible way to have a good um, agreement on this thing. So, and uh, the regulation is needed, but um, we don't know what to do about it. And uh, because uh, the technology is still in the infancy to form, and uh, there will be new kind of AI that will overcome the, the drawbacks of a current uh, learning-based AI. So when it comes out, it will be even more difficult to do. But yet, still we have to try very hard to, to do, uh, to think ahead by actively communicating, sharing ideas between regulators, technological people, and the many uh, third party people, you know, uh, so that we can find, maybe tr by tr trial and error, to find the best way to, to accept, embrace this new technology. That's okay. good. Yes, I think those two are kind of difficult questions to address. <laughs> Um, the second question first, uh, how do we uh, communicate our, to reach a common understanding of principles and objectives? I think that is, uh, isn't that a question for diplomats? Uh, <laughs> um, so I think it's no coincidence that the standard, uh, the international standard setting body are, is IEEE and such, because the professional organization, it's always been international, they have been, there are participants and members from all, all countries who are practicing AI. So uh, I have a lot of confidence, maybe overconfidence in IEEE, as I, since I'm also a member, in, uh, def uh, in defining standards and all that. But I think um, uh, reaching common objectives and, and, and goals, I think the, perhaps from my perspective, the only way is to improve, uh, to increase uh, um, communications that we need to communicate even more than we have been. Um, like in any issues, uh, every country perhaps has a slightly different objective in using AI. And the, uh, I look to more international forums to, Im to involve different stakeholders, including government people and technologists, as well as company corporations to speak to each other. I think forums like this enabled us to communicate better. Um, the risk there is, though, uh, as I've been talking uh, at the World Economic Forum, is that a lot of there is a lot of there has there are a lot of assumptions, cultural assumptions from different countries about what ought to be the objectives. Uh, I think we should all reflect on uh, what we think ought to be objectives and listen to each other and understand the perspective of other countries and our own citizens and other citizens of where everybody's coming from. Um, and to do that, it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort and the, the will, the will, the goodwill, the, actually the willpower to try to understand, to reach a common uh, understanding of our objectives. Because if one country, uh, such as China or US, uh, decides to do everything unilaterally, then uh, we cannot achieve uh, common objective, um, uh, you know, for the benefit of humanity using AI. And then the, the um, what more can we do? Uh, I think more education, I, I mentioned this last time, ed more education of the people who are building AI technologies. The traditional education curriculum has never uh, instilled a sense of ethics or social impact in engineers. We just care about what we do in our labs and we have not been educated about the impact of things we do. So that needs to be done, and that needs to be done concretely. So there are s different universities trying to set up curriculums to educate engineers about social impacts. As you can imagine, it's very, very hard. And the reverse is also true. We need to have more STEM education in the core curriculum for non-specialists, non-engineers. And that's the way we can uh, improve our um, uh, communication. So education is very, very important. Thank you for these uh, questions. I would like to agree first with Professor Fung on the, the points made. I think that there needs to be a standard terminology for you know, what we're talking about when it comes to these technical terms. But it is, um, it is imperative and it is crucial for us to also make sure that we define it for the leadership because the decision at the end of the day is made by leaders. 
And I would like to actually go back to a conversation that I had yesterday with Abdullah Maqsud from the IPCC. And I asked him, how did you convince all these countries to actually come onto an agreement when it comes to climate change? And he said, we created many thousand page documents that had the impact of climate change and the effect on countries, so on and so forth. And honestly speaking, we didn't move forward because the leaders were not, did not have the time to read them and the advisors not have enough, uh, were not able to convince them to actually take a decision. So what they did was they condensed every report into three lines. The first line is climate change is real. Second line is it is happening. <laughs> and third is if we go beyond two degrees, we're all going to, it's going to be irreversible. So just having these three lines made all leaders actually come to the table and discuss this openly. I think we need to simplify uh, the terminology. We need to simplify the discussion for the leaders to ensure that they would at least sit on the table. Once they sit on the table, they'll bring the advisors, they'll bring the experts, and they will have you know, their fights and their debates, and they'll make sure that we come up with something jointly. But I think this is extremely important. The second, and this is another analogy that I would like to um, uh, relate to climate change as well. The, the way that climate change became a global call and everyone actually jumped on the train and was part of the discussion is extremely important for us to look at when we look at artificial intelligence. We need to have the same momentum. We need to have celebrities. We need to have experts. We need to have leaders. Everyone talking about the importance of people being involved and engaged in this discussion. And education, I think, is very important. But education will not be successful if we don't create the awareness for people to go into this field or for people to feel like they need to be part of this mm -hmm. discussion. So thank you for hosting this meeting. I think this is the first step, and we need to do a lot more. I think you had one question from... Oh, just can I just answer to that? Oh. The answer is staring us straightforward in our face, but it's an unpalatable answer. Uh, how do you get nations to cede a little more sovereignty to the UN and to the IEEE? I know that's not going to happen, but if you want bodies like these to do that, that's what's needed. Not going to happen in my lifetime, I'm pretty sure about that. But the bigger issue of technocrats versus generalists is, I think somebody kind of uh, misunderstood me. We need more technocrats to kind of inform the generalist bureaucracy of the risks and so on, but policy decisions should be made by the generalist, never by a technocrat. Technocrat, by definition, are not humanists. Sometimes they're not even human. <laughs> so, if, if you want a technocrat-led society, uh, that is a recipe for disaster. Global warming is a classical example, right? The scientific consensus of global warming should not be questioned. But the policy decisions that should be taken to mitigate global warming, that should be taken by the generalists, right? So there's a split there. And that is key when it comes to good regulation. Thank you. I think it's uh, nearly impossible to try and sum up this uh, panel because of the breadth of views presented. But I think three, or three ideas was kind of common across each of their presentation. Uh, one was clearly the excitement around um, using this for doing um, business, for conducting trade, for changing uh, societal realities, uh, for sustainable development goals, etc. And we saw uh, the business, economic, and social uh, good potential to be common uh, across the presentations. I think the second uh, human element was also visible in all of their presentations. How do you rescale, retrain, make sure that you carry a large population along with you? Uh, how do you give people purpose besides just giving them minimum pay and protection? So the purpose which comes from employment needs to be preserved if you want to retain stability. And the third, of course, was uh, training the government itself to be sensitized to the dimensions of implications uh, this particular revolution, the fourth IR, uh, presents itself. Um, on my part, let me propose something, because since uh, uh, we have said we don't have a technical think tank, and you have said there's an idea of, 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 of simplifying messages, um, uh, Ambassador Gill said, how do we put together a common objective? I think institutions like ours, uh, and uh, with the partnership with Chinese, American, European, uh, African institutions, uh, led by dynamic uh, um, diplomats and, and politicians who are with us today, I think it, it may not be a bad idea to, in the next six months, come up with a small working group that produces 10 norms for AI, which is then popularized by, by uh, celebrities, by people like you and Ambassador Gill, which are very broad in dimension, but generally uh, seem to apply everywhere. And why I say this is because this morning as I was 
thinking about this panel, I, I stumbled upon an article uh, in a think tank called the Evolution Think Tank. I have never heard of it, but uh, since I, I love trivia, I, was, I scroll through everything that appears on my uh, Twitter feed. And they, they have a very fascinating report where they have gone through 600 sources and have uh, investigated the dimension of morality across the world. And they said that morality is always and everywhere based on seven common traits. So they were able to find from China to Korea to Africa to India to the old Egyptians to the South and North America that seven traits were common to all definitions around morality. For example, if my eyesight permits me, let me read it. It says, uh, love your family, help your group, return favors, be uh, brave, defer to authority, be fair, and respect others' property. They said these seven strands of thoughts appear across 600 sources that have defined morality across ages and across geographies. Very interesting. So the idea is that as we prepare for something which is transformational from, from, narrow, from narrow AI to, broad, to general AI, I think it might be a good idea to put together seven or eight uh, basic normative ideas that should shape uh, uh, you know, the design and the production and the deployment of this particular technology. This is a view from an emerging world, one view from each from various countries. But uh, please join me in applauding this panel for their presentations.